Hi, I'm Emily. I'm Sean. I'm Taylor. I'm Mike. And I'm Natalie. And we're all seniors at Glenbrook North High School and we're participating as part of the International Experience Project. And this year we decided to um, do our project on the Czech Republic. But before we begin, we want to take a second to thank our school's FCCLA leaders, Ms. Mitchum and Ms. Petty, for helping us organize and plan throughout the whole process. And we want to thank my family friend, Krieta, and one of the teachers at our school, Ms. Holacek, for helping us put a personal touch on a project that only someone who is from the Czech Republic can provide. All right, and if you're interested in referencing the portfolio during our presentation, in the corner of our show, there will be a <laughs> number where you can reference the portfolio for more information. And now we're going to go into a brief history of the Czech Republic. So like many nations began, the Czech Republic started because migrating nomads began congregating into small towns in the region. It wasn't until a leader known as Samo called on the help of a European leader, Charlemagne, to help him unify the groups that Czechoslovakia was eventually created. Czechoslovakia began with the Przemysl dynasty, which was actually a brutal, brutal dictatorship. But like many br brutal dictatorships in history in the past, it was really successful in that there were many expansions, things were built, the economy flourished, and they took over neighboring nations such as the Moravian Empire. A lot of the citizens during the time period actually did not originate in Czechoslovakia. They were from neighboring regions, primarily Germany, and had migrated over. The only notable ruler from this time period is Ottokar II, who is known as the King of Gold and Iron, and this is because he was really, really into expansion. At the same time, the Habsburgs came into power in Austria, but this was disregarded by the Czechs as insignificant, though it came into play later in history. So the Przemysl dynasty eventually ran out of rulers and was replaced by the Luxembourg dynasty, which was not a brutal dictatorship. But its first ruler was John of Luxembourg, who came to the throne when he was only 14, so he knew nothing about ruler, ruling, and he just focused on money and expansion and was hated. But his successor was Charles IV, and he was really, really well liked because he was a big promoter of culture and the arts, and he created things like Prague Bridge and specifically Charles University, which was actually the first university of higher education in all of Europe. So he was a really big deal, and even today they recognize him as one of their most significant rulers, and that's why he's known as the father of the Czech nation. His successor, though, was Wenceslas IV, and he was really hated because he taxed artisans and merchants really highly in order to give money to the church. And when the church gained money, it gained power and began restricting its admission only to people who could afford it. So for the lower classes and the poor people, they were really, really upset, and it caused a lot of discontent because they could not attend church. And this is how the reformer, who you may have heard of, John Ho, came into the light of day. And he was a big, big criticizer of the church. He thought a lot of the things that they were doing was wrong, specifically um, the things that they did that restricted admission. So one of the things that he preached that was really important was sermons being given in the common language instead of in Latin. But the church doesn't take criticism well, so they convicted him of heresy and burned him at the stake. And even today, this is considered one of the greatest losses in all of the history of Czechoslovakia. But when he died, his movement didn't die because throughout his lifetime, he gathered a lot of followers known as Hussites who enacted the reforms he talked about during his lifetime. And it was actually this group that took part in one of the great historic movements that you may have heard of, which is the first devenestration at Prague. And if you don't know what a devenestration is, that's when you take someone and you throw them out of a window. So in the first devenestration of Prague, a council member was thrown out of a window for refusing to listen to Hussite demands. And a small Hussite war takes place, and the Habsburgs that I mentioned earlier came into power in Czechoslovakia. And the first ruler of the Habsburgs was Ferdinand I, but he was really insignific insignificant. But his successor was Rudolf II, and he was a big promoter of culture, arts, and education. So like people who promoted the same things in the past, he was really well liked except for by the nobles who hated him because no one's ever entirely happy. So they enacted the second devenestration of Prague, which again, someone was thrown out of the window, but this time instead of a council member, it was a noble. And the only other significant rulers from this time period were Maria Theresa and her son Joseph II because they were really big on education and industrialization and even brought in things involving that from nearby nations. And a small Czech national revival movement takes place where the Czechs began realizing how unique their culture was and how it had withstood the test of time. Okay, so now I'm going to transition a little bit forward for you guys. And I'm going to take you to the 20th century history. So it began uh, the, with World War I, and World War I began with uh, the Czech people being called on by the Austrians to help them fight the war. And the Czechs resented this and didn't fight because they hated the Austrians. And so, 
A few Czech nationalists went over to France during this time because they wanted to create their own country and be free from the Austrians. And so, with the help of France, America, they became Czechoslovakia under the Treaty of Versailles. This is a huge accomplishment for the Czech people. Czechoslovakia is made of both the Czechs and the Slovaks, two very different people under one nation. Tensions began to rise between the two, but this was put to a halt because World War II was on the verge of breaking out. Hitler wanted a place called Sudetenland, which was a highly German area in Czechoslovakia. France, Britain, and a bunch of other European countries urged Czechoslovakia to give up that piece of land to Hitler because they were so scared of him. Eventually they did, and peace lasted for about 30 days, until Hitler decided to take over the rest of Czechoslovakia. So, they lost their land, and 360,000 people died because of this awful tragic war. They were not a free people during this time. It wasn't until the Czechs pleaded and Stalin's men came and helped them, and they set them free because they took down the German army. So they looked to Stalin and the Soviet Union as their answers as like what they could how they could be better and how they could be stronger so communism became a very prominent thing in the Czechoslovakia Stalin and his men began to rule with an iron fist and it became their downfall all until President Dubček came into power about 20 years after he was very nice and caring and he loved the people of Czechoslovakia unlike all the other previous rulers in the past few decades he gave them a freedom of speech, and he let them write an essay called 2,000 Words. This was an anti-communist essay, and what it did is it made the Soviets really mad. They hated the fact that there was anti-communism, so they took Czechoslovakia back under their power. So for another 20 years, the Czechs were under a rule and oppression and a communistic regime by the Soviets, and it wasn't until 1989 when the Czechs realized that they could take their power back, and so they held a revolution. And it took less than a week, and it went so smoothly that it is actually called the Velvet Revolution. Czechoslovakia prospered after this. Things went well. There were ideas flourishing. But then again, the Czechs and the Slovaks were still two very different people. The Czechs had the money and the power. The Slovaks didn't like that as much. And so, not too long after, people began to get the idea that maybe the two people were not meant to be under one country. And so, in 1993, on December 31st, the country split into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Now, a lot of people had to realize if they were Czech or Slovakian because they had mixed parents. So this became an issue to a lot of people. And all of that brings us to, to today, where tensions are pretty good in the Czech Republic. So now I'm going to finish up with history. As you can see, there's a huge, fast amount of it, and take you over to the flag. So as you can see, we created the flag on the letters of the Czech as we spelled out, and it's made of blue, red, and white. So the blue triangle, uh, it represents the, the loyalty of the people. And then on the stripes, there's a red one, which represents the courage and patriotism. And as you can see, this white stripe represents the honesty of the people. So the Czech flag was originally taken from the Czechoslovakian flag, which was created in 1920. And when the country split, the Czech Republic decided to take that flag with them, and Slovakia created a new flag. Yeah. All right, and so now on to my best part, my personal favorite, the Czech cuisine. So in the Czech, you can find a lot of different foods, but they're big on meats such as pork, beef, and their freshwater fish. It was, although it's been changing over decades, it was influenced by Austria and Hungary, two of its neighboring countries. In the capital city of Prague, you can find delicious ham all throughout. And then now on to tourism opportunities. Speaking of Prague, that's one of the biggest tourist destinations there. You can see beautiful castles all around the country. You can see street dancing like it shows here. Um, you can see the beautiful mountains and the rivers that the land has to offer, but you don't want to miss out on the dancing house in Prague and also the different style churches, especially the Gothic style churches that they have to offer throughout the country. They also are big on um, theaters and museums. The theaters show a more cultural aspect of the country while the museums have some history in case theirs wasn't enough for you. And then on to a display. So here we tried to replicate the Old Town Square. As you can see, there are a couple, there are row houses and the clock tower. So I'm going to start off by talking about the row houses. The row houses are, come in all different shapes, sizes, and colors. 
you can walk around and there's little shops near them and they kind of give the city the boxed in feel that it has and we tried to replicate that since we have a box in our display. The next part we tried to, to mock is the clock tower. It consists of three clocks as you can see. The top one was made by Emily, just a regular clock. And then this one was made by Sean and it's based off the solar and astronomical rotations. And then the bottom one, which is probably the most detailed, was made by Mike. And it's based off of the zodiac symbols and the apostles. And all together, they were made by a, the clockmaker. And a myth, common myth told is that the clockmaker had his eyes gouged out by the townspeople after he was done making it so that he'd never make anything as beautiful ever again. All right, and so if you're going to visit the Czech Republic, it's great to see everything that the country has to offer, but you want to know when to visit it. So the climates in the Czech, they do have four seasons like we do here. And I'll start off by talking about the best one, the fall. So in the fall is when the Indian summer is, and that's considered the best weather of the year because it's in August and it's nice and cool. It's not too hot, not too cold. And then September, it starts to get a little colder. And then in October is when the leaves start to fall off, taking us to the winter. And then the winter is when there's a little bit of snow on the tops of the mountains and not much in the town, which leads to the spring when all the snow melts and fills up the rivers. And then, and then after, the, when the rivers are nice and full, this weather's nice, but also the summer is really hot. It's not the driest, which is weird because it rains a lot there. So if you're gonna go, any season's good, but the fall's probably the best. And on to Mike. I'm gonna be talking about uh, geography now, and basically uh, the Czech Republic is split up into the east, which is Moravia, and west, which is Bohemia. And the majority of the land actually goes to the land itself, while a very small portion of it is actually the fresh water that they have. And for the usage percentage, 40% um, of their land is arable land, 3% um, is permanent crops, and 57% is others, so, which is basically the urban areas. And then for the water, 57% of the water in the Czech Republic is used for the industry, while only 1% is used for farming. And then for the environment, there's only one thing that I want to touch, which is their very heavy air pollution, which causes 3% of the, their total death, and it gives babies a 2.5 times higher death rate. But reforms are being made to get rid of their air pollution. And lastly, I want to talk about the economy. And the Czech Republic have their own economic history as well, which started with the fall of the Soviet communism and the implementation of their new government, which comes with new economic views as well. And this new economic view was the Western economic view, which was privatization of companies. And that started in 1990 to 1995, and they were projected to do very well. But around 1997, um, they actually went bankrupt, and their economy started to fail really bad. And you might be wondering how that's possible, and that's because the Czech Republic government still intervened with the businesses. So they gave aid to the businesses that should fall, but instead the businesses held and they had to drop workers. And because of this, their economy plummeted very strongly. But now, in 2000 to now, they made a successful recovery. And with that recovery, they were able to be invited into the EU. And with the EU, they were actually afraid at first to join because they were afraid that big countries such as Germany and France would overshadow their economy. And they and the other countries thought that the Czech Republic uh, citizens would run into their borders and take their jobs. But actually, the Czech Republic did very well. Um, as you've seen today, there's one of the strongest um, European economic powers. And now I want to touch on some industries, one being the beer industry. And the Czech Republic absolutely love their beer. And because of this, they make around 20 million hectoliters annually. And 2 million of it gets exported. Now, it might not seem a lot from their total, but it is still generates a generous amount of income. And lastly, I want to talk on coal mining, which actually lasted, I mean, started with communism and is still one of the strongest industries today as well. So with economics comes the politicians who have to implement the policy. So the Czech Republic actually has a multi-party parliamentary representative system of government. And in this type of system, multiple parties actually have the capacity to gain representation in the government. But they form a coalition so that one party can't dominate over the other parties, which creates a balance with that, between them so they can peacefully coexist. And the government is split into three branches, which are executive, legislative, and judicial. And I'm going to start by touching on the executive branch. 
The executive branch is led by the president and the prime minister, and the current president is Milos Zeman, and he's actually the first president to be directly elected by the people, which definitely shows a democratic transition from the previous communist times for the Czech people. The legislative branch is bicameral, and it's split to the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate. The Chamber of Deputies is a lower house and consists of 200 members, and they're the first ones to receive legislation. After that, after it's voted upon, it's sent to the Senate, which is the upper house, and consists of 81 members. The legislative branch is not widely received by the people because there's a lot of corruption. A Chamber of Deputies member cannot be convicted of a crime unless it's voted upon by the other Chamber of Deputies members, so a lot of crimes actually go unnoticed. So I'm going to make a huge transition all the way over to entertainment. The Czech national hobby is actually mushroom hunting. During the summer months, the Czechs will go through the forest and will forge the forest floor looking for mushrooms. And over 70% of Czech people actually participate in this event annually. And because of this, the Czechs are referred to as mushroom fanatics. Um, a huge part of Czech culture is their marionettes. In the Middle Ages, English, Dutch, German, and Italian theaters came over to the Czech Republic and they brought with them these marionette shows. And it took a while for this to get started, but by the late 18th century, the first Czech-born puppeteers um, began their businesses. And they started out like small family businesses, which were past father to son. And eventually, they grew into a revered art a reared art form during the formation of the Czechoslovak Republic, which was considered the golden age of the marionette making. And these drew mass crowds, and because of this, ideas like the Enlightenment were able to spread faster than they would have otherwise. And because theaters were not censored, people were able to express their discontent with the government, and because of this, the puppeteers were actually revered as revolutionaries. Um, an important piece of these marionette shows was the music behind them. The Czech Republic is a powerful music tradition, as represented by the phrase that in every Czech is a musician. Um, one of the most important forms of music in the Czech Republic is the polka, which actually began in Bohemia, not in Poland as many people think, and the style is spread internationally. And it can be seen in the works of classical composers such as Shostakovich, Johann Strauss, and Igor Stravinsky. And an interesting fact is that in the 1800s, um, Moravians actually emigrated to Mexico and they brought with them their music. And because of this, Mexican music is actually influenced by Czech music. And so I'm gonna talk about our outfits. Taylor actually made these for us. And so women traditionally, this is what a traditional woman would wear. And then, um, and then the, they, oh, oh, sorry, go on. Oh no, and this is what a traditional Czech man would wear. And then they also wear these outfits, the girls' outfits and the guys' outfits, to dance in, to dance the polka. So, actually, Natalie and Mike have prepared a polka dance for us, which we, they will perform now. Ready? Okay, so we'd like to thank you for taking your time and hearing our presentation. And we hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed presenting and learning about this and doing all of this. It was just a great experience. And one thing that we feel that we can t really take away from this is how much diversity the world has. One of the pillars of FCCLA mentions uh, understanding and creating harmony and peace with, within and around the world. And we feel that we can do that best by helping people understand each other better. And we feel that by learning and gaining knowledge about another culture, we can do this, so thank you.